Ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome to our first South America web conference series. For who does not know me yet, my name is Philip Close Morero. I'm in charge for our South American business, including three rural offices in Brazil and to the coordination of our GPSA partners in South America. Rural Partner, as you know, is the biggest German professional service firm and we are one firm with around 110 offices in 50 countries. However, we serve our clients already in more than 120 countries, basically all over this world with German quality. In such countries where we don't have own offices yet, this is done in coordination with our German Professional Service Alliance member firms, which builds kind of the outer ring, if you like, around our one firm. As we have today Lufthansa on board of our panel, our German Professional Service Alliance is basically kind of our star alliance. And we got three of our Colombian member firms today also on panel. Right now, I'm sitting here with our host or your host, Karen Steuer, in our brand new studio, Atlanta, which is based in our regional head office next door to the German Chamber of Commerce in Sao Paulo. We have decided to kick off our South American event series with Colombia, which is located right in the heart of the Americas. Ladies and gentlemen, in a world of increasing man-made chaos, uncertainty and darkness, we want to look a bit also on the bright side. We call Colombia a shining rising star, as a star in the heavens basically since the beginning of time represents order, light, and opportunity. Special thanks to our sponsors to make this happen. Yeah, great partners like Latin America Fine, the AHK Colombia, Swiss Cam Colombia, and the Holland House. And thanks also very much to our special panel guest, Antonio Kuko from Lufthansa based in Colombia, which will be presented shortly by Carl. As I speak, guests still tuning in, we are above 100 right now, 120, but we expect over 250 registered guests, and uh, so we shall start. Um, for those new to this tool, maybe quickly some safety instructions, yeah, so basically during the flight, if you like, yeah, your, your um, camera and your microphone are deactivated. This is only to enable a solid stream and a safe uh, flight without turbulences, yeah? But of course, we encourage you, please, to submit your questions, yeah? Be very active, yeah, if you like. In the question function in the panel, should be to the right of your screen. Um, submit your questions. We will pick it up at the end. At the end of the show, we will uh, try to answer all questions coming in. And if we don't manage um, in the time, we will come back to you individually. Before Karen introduces our panelists, it's my honor uh, to hand over the word to Orlando Baccaro, uh, who worked in different uh, Latin America markets already and is currently based as the general manager of the Latin America Fine in Hamburg. Orlando is born in Bogota, Colombia, and what could be a better perfect fit to kick off this event? Ladies and gentlemen, fast new seatbelts and enjoy the flight that will take approximately 90 minutes. Orlando, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, thank you for inviting me. I think this is a very great and very good opportunity to present, of course, my country, but one of the best performing countries in Latin America to a broader audience. When I saw the title, Colombia, the Shining Star, I became a bit of nervous. But reading and seeing more, I think it's great. But let me give a few words about the Latin America Business Association. The Latin America Fine was founded 104 years ago. If we saw those times, the world was in a war and a pandemic was arising, the Spanish flu. So merchants from Hamburg and from Bremen get together as they were seeing the supply chain and communications over the world was getting disrupted. Now we are not in war, but we are a kind of pandemic and a kind of war against the virus. And I think more than ever, 
the networking, the information is key and important to do business. I think this opportunity, having the GPSA from Ruder and Partner as one of our member firms of the Latin American Association, the German Chamber in Colombia, also as a member of our association, I think everybody has it in the Latin America Fine in Hamburg, of course. We have a huge and a very kind of state-of-the-art community where you can get all information you need, all the things you need to perform well. And be aware of what you are going to expect if you go to Colombia or any other Latin American country. But back to Colombia. I think Colombia faced very huge challenges. As everybody knows, the peace process is not running as wished by many of people. The fiscal needs of the state, depending on oil and coal, are under trouble high unemployment rate, and of course now the COVID crisis. But also if you see, Colombia has one of the best organizations in half the country. You have, you have quite a bit of information, quite country level information and everything. You have great opportunities for agriculture, for example, having all the kind of climates and everything you need, water and, and mud. You are not concentrated in only one side. You have a lot of spots where you can do business in a different way. You have a diversified industry sectors in, all across the country. So you find a spot very well prepared and very willing to do business. It's a great opportunity to see Colombia. If it is the shining star or if it's going to become the shining star, I think we want to be more wisely after this webinar. So I'm sure you're not here to listen to me, so not to other big and important panelists. So I hand it to Karen again. Karen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And for any contact or so, please feel free to write me or contact me. Thank you very much. Excellent, uh, uh, Orlando. Thanks for your introductory remark. Yeah, very much appreciated. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, now meet your pilot for today's flight, uh, uh, if you'd like, to Colombia, uh, Steuer. Is German and means tax. Norman is Norman. Yeah, uh, it is certainly no coincidence that Herr Steuer is our head of tax at Rödel and Partners South America. Being a lawyer and an accountant, she was raised in Brazil, but speaks four languages as she went to a German school here. Karen is also very active in the junior chambers of both Latin America Fine of Orlando and AHK Sao Paulo here next doors. And Karen managed together with me our GPSA South America activities, like for instance, this event. Orlando and I will stay now in the back and Karen shall take over as your host. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, Philip. It has been really um, a pleasure for me to work for Hüdlum Partner for the last four and a half years. And now, of course, uh, it's an honor to moderate this panel discussion, uh, strengthening the bounds that we have with our dear colleagues in Colombia, and especially also with our guest speaker, Mr. Coco. Thank you very much. Um, so in this sense, uh, I would like to start by introducing our first panelist, Mr. Thorsten Kötschau, who is the managing director at the German Chamber of Commerce in Colombia. He's been working there for the last one and a half years but has also worked for other chambers before, like uh, the German chambers in India and in Uruguay, as well as the IAHK in Berlin. So, Thorsten, um, perhaps, and especially given your position at, at the Achaka, as, as you call it in Colombia, and having the contacts to several different German industries that conduct business there, um, what would you say, what is the perspective perception of the German companies about the political framework and the general economic situation in Colombia? Sorry, Tosn, I think you're yes. still on mute. I think now you can hear me. Sorry, I was still in, I still in mute. Thank you very much, Karen. Very good morning to everyone. Very good morning from, from Bogota. It's a pleasure for me to, to present to you the point of view of the German Colombian Chamber of Commerce, an institution which is operating in Colombia since 85 years. Um, Orlando already mentioned the title, The Shining Star, uh, which is definitely an appropriate title for, uh, for Colombia 
Uh, but I would also like to call it the rising star, given its phase of development and, and the opportunity. Um, Karen, if you, if you allow me, I would just like to, brief, to briefly talk about the current situation in Colombia regarding the coronavirus. Um, we're in a lockdown since 24th of March. In Bogota, we already, we already started one week earlier. Since 1st of June, it is a so-called intelligent lockdown, which means that the local authorities can decide on the courses of action, depending on the severity of the pandemic um, in their respective locality. Um, despite the early lockdown, the numbers of persons infected with COVID unfortunately is, is, or has risen during the last couple of months to a number which has last week surpassed also Germany and, and Italy. So thinking about the, the business environment, and we also heard this um, in, the, in, in the introduction, um, that the turmoil in all over the world in terms of the, the, the international markets and also the dispute, if you want to call it like this, between the US and China. Um, I would think it would be reasonable that the companies, the German companies, European companies, they focus prim primarily on the German and European market. Because also from Latin American countries, you don't unfortunately read too many positive articles nowadays. And I feel that this really does not reflect the situation um, of the countries and the region. Just one example, I read once, in a very renowned German um, newspaper, which does not write so much about Colombia. Um, they published an article that the former house of drug lord Pablo Escobar will be demolished. And I was just staggered saying that, so this is the information which you really get from South America, from Colombia in this case, to Germany and Europe. So there's a lot, there's a huge lack um, of, of, of information, important information um, in, in Europe and in Germany. So I appreciate that Rödel and partner uh, and its partners in Colombia offer this really important event so we can talk about the opportunities at the same time, the risk about doing business in, in Colombia. Um, we have 200 wholly owned subsidiaries of German companies already here in Colombia and more than 300 German companies having sales agents in the country. Um, another sign of growing interest of German companies in the Colombian market are the branch openings of the Deutsche Entwicklungsgesellschaft, the DEG, and the KFW EPEX. Bank, which are both subsidiaries of the KFW Banking Group. And we, fortunately, we see that the interest in the Colombian market is increasing. And you might ask, so why is that? Um, if you only hear about like those negative effects or this negative information. Um, in a nutshell, I can mention the following reasons. We have more than 50 million people, which makes it an interesting market and actually the third largest in Latin America. We have a young population, 55% are younger than 30 years, and we have a growing middle class. Uh, Colombia is in a privileged position, having coasts in two oceans, the Pacific and the Atlantic. We have a stable political situation. So even when there's a change in government from one political, si political side to another, there's not a big change in economic policy as we see it in, in other countries. We have a stable economic situation. For example, the inflation rate in the 12 months between June 2019 and May 2020 was only at 2.85%. I am also responsible for our chamber in Venezuela. And last year we had their inflation of around 20,000%. So if you don't want to go into that extreme, you might also think about Argentina, which had an inflation of 53%. It's just showing that actually the inflation rate and the situation is very stable. Also, we have a stable economic growth. So of 3.5% per annum over the past five years, which is the strongest growth in all of Latin America. And in the first quarter of 2020, the Colombian economy, economy grew by 1.1%. And we were all very optimistic about the projection of the year. Well, and then came the pandemic, and then came COVID to the continent and to Colombia. And of course, also as we have it in, in, in all over the world, also the consequences here were, were tough. So the, uh, the economy, the Colombian economy will probably decrease by five to 5.5%. Um, which again would be the best, num best number probably here in the continent. The unemployment rate went up from 9.5% in December to 21.4% in May due to the crisis. Um, the low oil price hits the budget of the Colombian government in a very hard manner for the budget 2020. The government planned with a barrel price of around $65 and we were already as low as $20 per year uh, per barrel this year. This makes also the Colombian peso very volatile. In, in mid of February, one euro was, was, was worth 3,660 peso. 
So one euro, 3,660. And yesterday we stood at 4,370. This makes imported goods and services more expensive for Colombian clients and consumers. But as one Colombian industrialist told me once, he said, well, we can live with a weak peso, but please make it stable so I can calculate more precisely. So we see these negative effects of COVID all over, all over the world, um, but we are rather optimistic, we and other experts actually, about the future of, uh, of Colombia. Two weeks ago, the Colombian Minister of Finance said that he expects an economic growth of around 6% uh, for the next year. Um, this is very optimistic. I'm not sure if this will really be the case, but definitely Colombia will be back on track soon and will then show attractive growth figures to, to companies. And why is that? Why is that we are so optimistic? Um, I think it is worth mentioning before that, or primarily that despite all the problems which the country had had has had in the past, conflict with rebel groups like the FARC, uh, conflict with drug cartels, Colombia has had only three recessions until this year. So we, uh, we had recessions in 1930, 1931, and 1999. Over the last couple of more than 20 years, there was a stable growth. So it seems like a safe bet to, to invest in Colombia. For the coming years, until 2030, the International Monetary Fund also projects a growth of around, of more than 3% per year for Colombia. The government continues with its investor and business-friendly policies, such as the reduction of the corporate tax rates, uh, I'm sure that our lawyers and tech specialists will, will touch on that topic. Um, Colombia has more than 15 free trade agreements in force, enabling preferential access to, to more than 60 countries, uh, including the United States, the European Union, Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Peru, and other countries. The free trade agreement between Colombia and the European Union is in place since August 2013 and diminished the import duties of almost all goods and services to 0%. Um, the reputation of goods and services made in Germany. Germany is already the fifth most important seller to Colombia worldwide and the most important of the European Union. Um, and very important for me also that Colombia and the Colombian government is looking towards the future. There are new initi initiatives like the Economia Naranja, which is like the creative industry which the government wants to push. Um, and we have also a lot of investments, for instance, in clean energy. Um, for instance, the first center for the fourth industrial revolution in Latin America was opened last year in Medellin. If you think Medellin, the most or one of the most dangerous cities in the in the 1980s, has now become really a site for progress, for innovation, and it's great to see that the first center for the industrial fourth industrial revolution will be set up or is being set up here in in Colombia. And very important also, you find reliable partners here in Colombia, such as, as Rödel and its local partners, and us as, um, as RK Colombian, as HK Colombia. We're also looking to the future. My team and I have literally changed our business model from one day to, to another. We offer fully digital services. We work on topics like virtual reality, 3D impression. We organize um, online business matching, matchmaking events. And from September onwards, uh, once you can travel again, we can also offer you a co-working space with all the amenities possible, which you know from WeWork, um, et cetera. So I guess later on, I will talk about also the, the, the sectors which are the main drivers of growth. But uh, um, responding to your question, Karen, what is the, the opinion of the German companies here? Um, we actually did a survey among our members and asked, for instance, about the risk for their business in Colombia. And if you read this, mm, these articles about the drug laws and, and, uh, um, and the rebel groups, uh, you might think that the physical security here is, is very bad. It's not. Among the top 10 risks mentioned by the German companies here, there was not, that was not even a topic. It was not even among the top 10. So the physical, secu the physical security wasn't really even mentioned. Um, what was the like one of the most difficult points and still is is as I mentioned the volatile peso, um, the the volatile currency. So uh, for them it's it's difficult when there's um, when there's this up and downs in the currency. It's very difficult for them to to predict the business and to predict the prices to sell here in in Colombia. So that was that was a big risk. Um, another risk 
is, if you want to call it like this, the maybe the situation in Venezuela. Um, there was a lot of migration from Venezuela to Colombia. Um, more than more than four million Venezuelans already left their country. Most of them left through Colombia. More than or around two million stayed in Colombia. Others they then went to 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 other countries. And of course, this is for the for the health system. This is for the the labor market in especially the informal labor market, a big, a big problem and a big risk. Another risk which we can see here is the, is the, um, uh, the volatile commodity prices also. Yeah? As I mentioned, these are very important for the Colombian government and for, for, the, for the budget. Um, another weakness, if we want to call it like this, is the, the infrastructure here in Colombia because there are high transport costs so if you would like to send a container from the port in, in Cartagena to Bogota, the price is the same as when you ship it from Hamburg to Cartagena, for instance. But seeing this as a weakness, and also the Colombian government understood that this is a weakness, they are working on it. And I guess much uh, a little bit later, Karen, I will talk about uh, the infrastructure, which is one of the main drivers um, mm -hmm. of the growth here in, in Colombia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thorsten. So perhaps I would just like to encourage the audience as well. You may use the tool. There is an option to do questions uh, to us. Uh, and as Philip mentioned, we will uh, come to those questions at the end. There is, we have some uh, space and time for Q&A session after the, the, this panel discussion. So please use the tool and we will reply to those questions. So uh, Thorsten, you, you said um, about the, the the perspective for growth uh, in the region in, in, in Colombia. So now, now looking into the, this future, what can be expected, let's say, in this next years uh, for this economic scenario? Which are the main sectors you understand would push the, the Colombian economy from, from your perspective? Um, I mentioned already the, the lack maybe of certain infrastructure here in, in Colombia. And actually, the infrastructure sector is one of the the largest drivers of growth here. The, the Colombian government plans to invest more than $70 billion in improving civil engineering as well as transport infrastructure. Um, until the year 2035, this will finance the largest infrastructure package in Colombian history. Um, and we see a lot of areas where German companies and European companies offer innovative technologies, which can find definitely an interesting market in Colombia. Just to mention some of the most important infrastructure projects, Karen, here in, in Colombia. Um, those of you who have, who have been to Colombia, who have been to Bogota and who know the, the traffic, know that we need a metro. Actually, the first line of the metro, uh, Bogota, will be built. Um, I guess the construction will start next year. The tender is already done. There's already the winner, which is a Chinese company. Um, it is an estimated cost of $4.5 billion. Then there is, for instance, an elevated light rail in Rio Negro, which will transport 500,000 passengers per day. There's a Western Regio, uh, Regio Tram project, which seeks to connect the municipalities around Bogota. This is an investment of 1.7 billion. And maybe the most important, the most important is the master plan for intermodal transport. Uh, this is the largest infrastructure project in all of Latin America and uh, seeks an investment of around 69 billion dollars. This includes, among others, um, the expansion of the road infrastructure, tunnels, modernization, adaptation, expansion of 35 airports, um, the transformation of Colombia's road network, and also the use of um, the, the rivers for, like, a, there's a national fluvial plan for, for transport. In June, we organized a virtual delegation of German companies from the infrastructure sector to Colombia. Uh, we also organized a conference in which participated, participated the Minister of Transport of Colombia, the Lord Mayor of Barranquilla, which is the fourth largest city of Colombia, as well as the President of the Colombia Infrastructure Agency. And they all assured us of, of course, the interest in attracting further investment, but at the same time also reassuring that the companies of attractive investment conditions here in, in Colombia. Apart from infrastructure, I would also like to mention agriculture. It is said that in Colombia, only around 20% 20, 20 of the area which can be cultivated are actually being farmed. And in the last couple of years, we've seen 
a lot of foreign investment coming into the industrial agriculture sector, um, which also benefits German technology or European technology providers. Also, solutions uh, of environmental technology are being very much sought after in Colombia. The installed capacity, for instance, of renewable energy in Colombia is expected to increase. We were only at 2% in 2018. This will increase to 14% in 2025 and to 21% in 2030. And there are already dozens of projects of wind, solar, and biogas in place. And um, as, we, as we heard, there are many more to come. Another topic um, is the, the water and wastewater treatment. This is also of great importance here in Colombia and Bogota, for instance, will be built a large sewage, a large sewage um, treatment plant, which is called PPAR Salitre, for around $500 million. So these are just, uh, Karen, some of the sectors in which we see uh, great potential for European and German companies to, to invest, to be active. And of course, if there are uh, companies from other sectors, we are, we are more than happy to, to help them also find um, opportunities in those. Awesome, thank you very much for your contribution until now. Um, so now uh, I would like to invite our guest speaker. It's really a great honor to have your special participation, Mr. Cuoco, and thank you for making yourself uh, available. We understand, let's say, the challenging moments for, for your industry and how time consuming it is. So just to present to the audience, Mr. Antonio Cuoco is Lufthansa's Managing Director for Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. He has more than 30 years of experience in this uh, aviation industry, and most of his career has been developed in the Lufthansa Group, where he has had the opportunity to show his experience in the European, Asian, and since 2019, the Latin American markets. So thank you, Mr. Cuoco. So perhaps let's go directly into the, the first question for you. Uh, what are the expectations for the civil aviation sector in, in Colombia? I think you're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> now it should be okay. Thank you, Karen, and a warm welcome to everybody. Uh, the aviation sector in uh, the all Andean region, so not only Colombia, but also Peru, Ecuador, Bolivia, is the backbone of the transportation system. Uh, there is in the, re the Andean region uh, not so developed uh, railroads, uh, not so many roads, highways overall. So the uh, air transportation is key for the whole uh, uh, region and I would say also for the whole continent where the distances are much higher than in Europe. Uh, Lufthansa is present in this market since 52 years, since 1967, um, where we fly to Bogota. And Bogota is uh, a kind of hub within the Andean region, as our customers can buy a Bogota coming from Lima, from Quito, from La Paz, from Guayaquil, uh, from Caracas, uh, can uh, reach via Frankfurt all destination uh, worldwide. Um, this uh, position as hub from Bogota Airport has been, of course, uh, boosted in the past years uh, with the political situation in Venezuela where before most of the airlines were flying and now moved uh, rather to, um, uh, to Colombia. Talking about figures, Colombia had last year 45 million passengers transported out of them uh, 35 min uh, million passengers uh, arriving, departing, and transiting Bogota Airport. It's a figure in continuous growth. Talking uh, about figures, the Airport Council International, that is the International Association of Airports all over the world, forecast that Colombia will reach in the year 2030 100 million passengers. It's a huge growth. Colombia is expected to be worldwide among the top eight countries uh, talking about growth of, um, of passengers. 
talking about the actual situation, everybody knows that in the current situation, um, the borders of most of the countries, also of Colombia, are closed. And also in this period, also today, airlines are providing uh, vital supplies via cargo flights. Uh, we had on our last flight uh, one and a half week ago over 21 tons, mostly medicines, coming into the country. And as well with repatriation flights in both directions, allowed to keep somehow a minimum of contacts uh, between uh, Colombia and uh, Europe, but as well other um, countries like in North America. So air transportation was, is, and will be also in future for Colombia a vital sector. And uh, the airlines are meanwhile in Colombia ready uh, with the so-called um, bio uh, security protocols. Uh, that have been implemented by all airlines, also Lufthansa. The airports are ready with measures, and the industry hopes that soon the president and the government will allow to reactivate uh, regular flights. Um, to give you still some figure to show how important is the airline industry for the country, just one daily international flight, intercontinental, flight uh, assures more than 300 uh, working places and if we talk about the industry uh, all airlines according to IATA the International Air Transportation Association in Colombia the sector guarantees 72,000 direct and more than 280,000 indirect jobs so overall we are talking about um, 300, more than 350,000 jobs uh, that contribute uh, by 7.5 billion to the economy of Colombia. This is almost 3% of the GDP of uh, the country. But despite all the current situation, considering uh, the past growth in uh, Colombia, not only of the um, overall economy like was mentioned uh, by Torsten uh, but also specifically by civil aviation uh, I think we can have the hope to look in the future uh, in a kind of uh, opti with some kind of optimism provided that the specific core of the corona crisis somehow be solved thank you Thank you very much, Mr. Cuoco. So um, now my next question may sound a bit provocative, um, but you mentioned that uh, the contribution to country is about uh, also the, the work, working positions, but what else has Lufthansa been contributing to, to the country in the, in the recent months? Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, we have kept our uh, teams. We have a team here in Bogota. We have a much smaller team in uh, Venezuela where we keep a uh, presence because we are confident uh, that um, the country could reactivate its economy as well. Uh, it is uh, the country with the biggest oil reserve worldwide. So there is there also a potential. Um, our staff, uh, we have not reduced so far the staff. We have kept uh, the, the staff in, uh, in both countries. Of course, we have been forced to reduce the, the working times uh, due to the current uh, situation. And from the other side, we have been uh, quite active in the region with repatriation flight of airlines of the Lufthansa Group. So not only Lufthansa, uh, mainly to Frankfurt, but also, for example, Edelweiss, uh, that is a subsidiary of Swiss Airlines that is part of the group with flights uh, not only to Bogota, but as well to Lima, uh, and uh, to Quito. We have just in Colombia 
transported <clears throat> uh, more than uh, 1,200 passengers on this uh, repatriation flight, not only Germans, uh, but also European citizens. And as I mentioned, we have as well uh, transported cargo supply needed uh, for uh, the country. Talking also about figures, uh, this has been also a very small part because Lufthansa Group worldwide has, um, has um, had more than 350 uh, repatriation flights where have been transported home more than 70,000 uh, Europeans. So we hope that the situation can improve um, the strictest biosecurity standards are ready, and our main priority is to maintain, uh, to assure 100% health both for passengers as well as our crews, and keep this important position to assure the connection between Colombia, between the Andean region and the other destinations where we fly here in the continent and Europe and the world. Thank you. Um, and, and of course, it's it's not an easy job to keep all these positions and the figures that, that you just shared are incredibly high. So um, that's great. And what are the next steps uh, for Lufthansa around the world? not only Colombia, but uh, generally speaking? Well, um, we have in the, uh, in the deepest uh, period of the corona crisis, uh, we have reduced uh, our fleet uh, that of 760 uh, aircrafts, we have grounded almost 97% of the fleet. Uh, just 3% of the flights were operating. Uh, Lufthansa has been uh, considered um, within Germany uh, as one of, uh, together with the airports, as one of the strategic infrastructure for the country. So we have uh, maintained uh, during the whole period of the corona crisis a minimum of domestic um, connections within Germany uh, to some main European cities, some main destinations worldwide, uh, but we are talking about just 3% of the flights. And as I mentioned before, we have uh, repatriated several German and European citizens. Um, now we have in small steps, uh, started to reactivate the flights and, and we expect that by the end of October uh, we will be able to serve uh, almost 75% uh, of our uh, of the destinations that were served previously of course not with daily or double daily flight but with a, a thinner uh, flight schedule but still reconnecting countries and reconnecting people. Uh, in this connection, it is of course also important to see how we'll develop the different countries with the restriction, entry restrictions, but we are working also there on possible solutions. For example, passengers have now the possibility in Frankfurt, in Munich, to make before departure or upon arrival a coronavirus test and to receive after a few hours uh, a result that if it's negative will allow already in some countries to entry avoiding uh, a quarantine. So we are reactivating the network. Um, there is uh, currently, uh, there are currently negotiations with the different unions uh, to reach agreements with our workers because we want to keep as many as possible um, of our workers on board um, and to be able so to uh, have a possible when the recovery will become even faster, even stronger uh, to be ready to start again. 
we have to say one thing to be very very clear uh, our industry has been one of the most uh, of the industries that has been most hit by the um, corona crisis and uh, we do not expect a recovery on short term um, if we compare it with the levels of 2019, we expect to reach these levels rather in 2023. So it will be a quite long recovery that will take roughly uh, three years. Um, we continue uh, to plan all possible scenarios. Uh, we have countries that are postponing uh, the opening of the border, so we have to react uh, quite flexible. Uh, we are looking for uh, several scenarios, and of course, uh, this is a challenge uh, during the pandemic to manage this uh, on uh, on small uh, on short notice. And we must strengthen the social capital and use all the possible technologies that the fourth industrial revolution has uh, brought. So it is time to leave risk aversion behind and seek more humanitarian solution that will allow to us, to Lufthansa Group, to be sustainable and overcome the situation together. And we are ready, talking about Colombia, to contribute in the reactivation of the Colombian economy. Mr. Coco, thank you very much for those uh, invaluable perspectives just shared. Um, this was really, really nice to hear, especially for su such an industry that is suffering so much, is also doing a lot. So I think that the word now is, uh, like you said, together. I think this, these are the words now. So uh, now uh, we would like to make the, the panel a little bit more interactive with our audience as well. And we now have a question for you, the audience, which I will just launch. You will probably see in, see in your screen. So, okay, um, when do you plan to restart the business travel into and outside Colombia? Uh, you will be able now to select the, the alternative that is most adequate on, on your perspective. We have, we will wait a couple more seconds if you, for people to participate. Did some of you already, I can already see a little bit the results. We will share the results. Just wait a couple more seconds until we reach, I would say, 50%. We have now 190 participants. It's really nice to have you. Okay, so I think I will close the, the votation. Let's see. Votation closed, and let's share the, the results. So, as we can see, around 40% has voted only next year. Um, yeah, Mr. Coco, perhaps is, if you would like to comment, is the answer what you have expected? Is this probably aligned with what you have seen? Well, um... Uh, thank you very much, Karen. I think that the um, the answers uh, more or less shows uh, mm -hmm. reflects what is the actual situation. Because if we look mm -hmm. to Colombia, borders are closed uh, at least until mm -hmm. uh, August uh, 21. And uh, the question is not just to reopen Colombia. The question is, as I mentioned before, uh, to have uh, all countries reopen their borders, and this is still unknown. Um, and uh, there is the necessity for the passengers when they travel, when they reach mm -hmm. destination, it doesn't matter if in Germany, in Europe, or in other countries, uh, that they don't have uh, to go 14 days in a quarantine. So I think that uh, if you look on the figures, 60% of um, the poll uh, 
uh, participants say that they will start to retravel this year what i think it's it's a it's a good figure and uh, that this is rather in the fourth quarter this i think it's depending from the current uncertainty uh, concerning the times uh, and uh, of opening the borders and the rules for travel thank you thank you thank you very much so I will now hide the stage again so everyone can see the panelists back. Well, again, thank you very much, Mr. Cuoco. Now I would like to invite uh, Mrs. Becky Cardozo. She is the founding partner of Global, Global Gap in Colombia. She's a CPA. Uh, she also has gotten an MBA a degree in the USA, and she is the responsible for the audit practice as the member firm of our GPSA in South America. Together with her, we have Matthias Gen Mr. Matthias Genros, who is located in Germany. And he is basically the German uh, arm of Global Gap in Germany, locally, having finance as his strong background, managing companies like Puma and Transtabilo in Latin countries. Currently, uh, he helps the German companies to do business uh, in Latin America. So thank you both for your participation and for your contribution. Um, Perhaps the first question to Beiki. Beiki, what have been the impacts and, uh, generally speaking, the lessons learned due to COVID for your audit clients? Could you share a bit with us? I think you're on mute. Sorry. We still don't listen to you, Beiki? Yeah. Um... Now we do. Great. Um, good morning, Karen. Good morning, and everyone. We are happy to have this opportunity to share um, our clients' experiences and our experiences with you. Um, so, things uh, to my surprise, to everybody's surprise, things have been moving very quick for our clients and for our office. So, when the corona crisis started, we saw how our clients change their structure really quick. They move into these new technologies really fast. Um, so as we were not able to perform our audits on place like other offices, um, we move our office to the home office uh, of all our audit um, team um so that was our surprise and we haven't uh having all these gadgets and new things to to be able to for everybody to work from home also another thing that that we saw is that even though the government gave some subsidies to the companies from germany not as many of our clients uh use these subsidies so only 10 percent of our clients really reduce their income um to uh, have the real need to use these subsidies. So, and that shows us that uh, even though we have this crisis, the uh, German companies have been able to sustain themselves, uh, keep on their revenue and maintain their teams. So that's also something that we saw. And now uh, most of our work clients have been back to their offices and even though they think of changing the way they work because they will be working more from um, home uh, they already have their industries their offices working they have been able to set up all the procedures that the hover government um, have told the companies to put in place so they are um, actively working and last something that i have seen is like um how companies have been able to team up and we have seen that the hacker too companies um have been seeing things differently so how can they team up to buy some supplies and then they will um, reduce cost how they can share technologies and then are able to support better their workers so um as a conclusion for us as an auditors this time of challenge 
has been hard for some industries and companies, but has also like open our eyes as a business people, as entrepreneurs, as a people that really want our country and world to keep in the same freedom, but even better. So that's the perspective and experience that we have been having with our clients. Thank you, Becky. Uh, perhaps then, Matthias, um, you as the financial expert, do you think that the role of the auditor has changed or will change due to COVID? What, what are the expectations? What, what do you think on this? Thank you, Karen. First of all, a nice welcome from my side or warm welcome. I'm some hours ahead from you. Uh, so here it's quite warm. Uh, so warm regards to everyone. Um, yeah, Karen, for my, me personally, uh, to be honest, not much has changed. Uh, because when I look back to my business life, I have recognized two types of, of auditors. Uh, the one auditor uh, normally came, um, checked, 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 uh, gave the opinion, that's it. Yeah, I prefer the second one who really becomes a partner. Um, and, uh, you know, if you have a new opportunity in your business, then normally uh, you discuss with your people, with your team, uh, you analyze and so on. If you have a, a good partner as an auditor, then you, of course, will give him a call because you know two very important things. The one thing is normally auditors have a very good uh, understanding about regulations and all this stuff. But more important in my perspective is that uh, audits have a, a, a huge network and also a big portfolio of clients with different industries and so on. And then often they know comparable things where they can assist you or where they can support you. Um, interesting if my, my thinking is, is, is really the case, uh, I found a study and this study uh, told um, that uh, the major opinion of clients was that auditing is not adding value to their decision-making process. Uh, 56 saw that audit as a, as a routine core that varied a little from year to year, and 60 said that audits did not raise any issues or ideas to enhance their processes uh, or decisions. Yeah, but now I think it's the time, and um, which is very important, because now in these days, the auditors are linked to many, many clients and they see uh, who are doing things right. And of course, if your partner uh, knows how things uh, develop better, um, where you can, let's say, adjust the organization or you find cash uh, opportunities, such things, this can, of course, help. And therefore, my mm -hmm. answer is, uh, for me, it doesn't matter if there's a COVID time or any other time. If you have a real partner and you really team up as partners, and then, and then, of course, uh, it is a great uh, advantage for you. Okay, so perhaps uh, what, what, because you mentioned to, to have the, this overview of many different uh, industries and you have a lot of clients, so could you select the three most, uh, uh, the three key matters for financials over the, the, the COVID crisis? At the moment, for me, three things are very important. First of all, the business model, second cash liquidity, and then the change of team and processes uh, to this crisis mode or to this COVID mode. And first of all, your business model. Uh, normally, if your business model is healthy or not, you will find out after a certain period of time. But COVID is an accelerator. That means normally some years ago, you would find this out uh, after maybe two years, three years. In these days, um, if your, let's say, profitability margin is not good uh, and your doors are closed down for three months, you immediately see that. And, and one thing is sure, many companies uh, will di die through this COVID uh, crisis. Yeah? Uh, on the other hand, if you have a good business model, uh, you, of course, have opportunities. Uh, that means this crisis will be over one day. And if you are a strong one and you overcome this time, then there are other opportunities. Maybe a competitor um, you can take over or you can enlarge your, your product portfolio. So there are also many, many opportunities. And that means also with regards to your business model and going concern, you should think about the future also these days. Then 
as it's always with finance, cash is king. So you need cash. Uh, you need to survive this this period. Uh, meaning, as mentioned, if the business model is nice and good, doesn't matter if you do not survive the next three months. And honestly speaking, uh, in these days, everybody is trying to collect receivables. Everybody is trying to increase the conditions to the suppliers. Therefore, you have to be really creative, I think, uh, legally creative, meaning you have to look for credit lines, for, for cash generating things and so on. If you don't need it, doesn't matter. But it's important that you have this as a, as a cushion. That is very important mm -hmm. in my perspective. And then finally, this uh, teaming up and the, the, the processes. Um, in these days, you really must prioritize. So, so you must focus everything on generating cash, on controlling expenses, um, and so on. Um, because um, one thing will be clear, the one who is fast and agile, mm -hmm. this person will be the step ahead. And this yep. person will be better surviving in this crisis times. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you, Becky, for, for your contribution. So now um, I would like to invite and introduce you to our BPO, the Business Process Outsourcing Partner in Colombia, Alejandro Garcia. Thank you very much for your participation as well. Alejandro is the, the junior partner at Tercio S.A., which is our GPSA member firm. Uh, they are a family-owned company focused on attending the needs uh, of international companies developing their business in Colombia. And they understand that the key factor is creating trust relation for a long-term partnership. As we, we heard today that it's kind of the Achterbahn, the roller coaster uh, economy in Latin America, which is quite common to have this uh, long-term perspective is, is, is key as well. So Alejandro, he has studied economics in Vienna and has gained his professional experience uh, in the European and Latin American business relation while he was working for uh, the private and public sector. He has lived around 15 years in Austria and Germany and has this deep understanding of the, of the German working culture. So um, Alejandro, well, for me, tax is always a specialty. Taxes are one of the key issues for, for, the, for a good business. So, and due to COVID, these are very relevant also because of liquidity, which Matthias was just mentioning. So which changes occurred in the area of taxes due to COVID in Colombia and uh, are there shorter measures taken by the government? H how do you see the future developments on this topic? Um, Karen, thank you very much for the, the introduction and uh, yeah, warm welcome to, to everybody also from, from Colombia here. Uh, thank you for, for inviting me and having the opportunity to be here. Um, well, you mentioned uh, your Steuer, uh, that's, that's your topic, that's your life, let's put it like that. And, and definitely that's, that's one of the key topics for, for um, for uh, foreign companies investing in Colombia. You know? So I would like to, to give a, a short introduction or, or what happened during the last months and how I see the perspective for the future. Um, uh, first of all, um, due, to, due to COVID, uh, the government uh, took some measures to support the companies in the area of liquidity. You know? So, I mean, we had uh, in Colombia, you present the income taxes around April and May, and definitely that was one of the key issues that the government uh, measures that the government take took to postpone those payments. You no, know, there was in general we could say there was no reduction of taxes. No, but the government uh, took the decision to postpone payments to support the, the topic of liquidity in, in those com in, in companies. So that was uh, at a general or on a national level, the national government took those decisions. So there was a postponement of, 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 of the corporate tax and the presentation of those taxes. So for us, we and our clients, we had to work on, let's say, reschedule our, our work together to comply with those uh, with those new uh, with the new schedule, 
and with the obviously with a question will the companies will have enough liquidity to pay for those taxes no so um definitely for foreign companies working in colombia uh also to send that information to their headquarters um, especially in our case in germany or in the us or the regional that take over the finance in colombia to to to, to be to make them aware of how was the issue how was the situation in colombia and if the companies if the local companies would require liquidity or cash support from their let's say mother companies uh, let's put it in this case Germany or abroad. No, that was one of the key issues. But in general, in, in Colombia, due to COVID, um, let's put it like this as resume again, there was no tax reductions. There was tax uh, postponements that was at a national level and also at a local level yeah, with industry and commerce taxes and property taxes and vehicle taxes. No, um, I would have like to see a more um, uh, from at a national level the local governments could have organized better to have a, more, a, a standard schedule but um, I mean that's that's local issues local politics that definitely um, would have supported the companies that definitely have to present different local different their taxes at a different local level local entities no but um, that would have been a, a, a better understand, so a good issue to support the companies for a better liquidity planning. But uh, in general, I believe that that would that would that would be the issue: uh, a postponement of taxes to support the liquidity of the companies. Uh, mm. Definitely, that um, and and that I mean, with the spending of the COVID, the government will increase its budget deficit no and that would lead us to the question is in the future what will be the tax burden for companies in colombia no so um the company you, they, i'm sorry that, therefore in this sense do you foresee that uh, should the investors expect a, a higher corporate income tax uh, on, on future tax reforms in colombia um yeah yes so there will be a tax reform definitely yes uh the government uh, wrote a paper has a, a fiscal framework on the middle term and 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 is 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 thinking that the deficit of this year would be around 8.2 percent and for the next year of five percent of the gdp so that's that raises the question okay where will the government take the money to, to support that deficit or to try to decrease that deficit? No, that's that's a big question. So uh, there will be a tax reform. We don't know it yet how, but the question is, will the corporate tax will be the one that they increase or will the government seek other tax, uh, other in so other, other areas to get to to obtain these revenues that the government is missing. Mm -hmm. As a context, um, the current government is a more tax friendly, so lower tax friendly cover, uh, so mm -hmm. policy. So, uh, so yeah, Alan, what you mentioned uh, about perhaps the when we talk about taxes, always the the international standards are are usually used as as the framework. And since now Colombia has joined uh, officially as uh, an OECD member in 2020, uh, what what would be which are the implications for for the investors uh, under this uh, perspective of uh, Colombia becoming an OECD member? How will how would this how do you foresee this would affect the foreign companies doing business there? So yeah, I mean as you mentioned, Colombia officially joined the on 2020 uh, the, the the OECD. That's, uh, that helps that Colombia can be more, com more easily compared and has a, a better understanding of what's compared to other developing or developed countries or developed economies. So uh, compared on the, on the corporate tax, Colombia has, is, is 
on, on the scale uh, has a tax burden on the corporate tax of, of, of around 50% or higher. If you compare it to Germany, Germany would be around 30, 35% if you take the corporate tax plus other taxes. No, so Colombia is on the high side. And that, if we increase corporate taxes in Colombia, that will make us less competitive with the other countries. And as we are, as OECD member, we want to be competitive with our peers that are right now the OECD members, no? So um, Colombia decided to join the OECD to be in this framework of policies that make us comparable and at the same time allow us to, to understand how other developed economies are, are doing and how we can change our, our, our policies to make us more competitive on that side. No, so on the tax side, we definitely are probably not the most competitive country, but the government will work on that or we will have the question if on the future we will, we will have on that. Uh, as, as you mentioned, as uh, being part of, of the OECD, that, that help us or the Colombian government sees us as a trust issue. We gain the trust to be member of this club and that we are able to apply policies that are comparable to your home countries. That means mm -hmm. uh, Germany, that means the Netherlands, that means Switzerland, or that means the US. So mm -hmm. we maybe not at that level right now, but we will implement e policies in this policy framework that would lead us to gain a better trust and a better uh, business environment. Uh, two, two just, just two issues before closing. Uh, that also brings companies to comply with OECD structures, OECD frameworks. Uh, just talking to mentions that transfer pricing. Uh, the gov so we have applied most of the OECD framework in transfer pricing. That means the companies will have to comply with transfer pricing. As you know, the topic of base erosion of profit shifting uh, shifting mm -hmm. that's beps no for 2019 uh, there mm -hmm. is the OECD beps 2.0 uh, and that would lead that the companies will have to comply to higher information yes. standards in colombia yes. and then we will work that with the auditing side okay thank you thank you very much alejandro i think now we would like to go perhaps a little bit into the legal framework and for that purpose, I would kind of like to invite Mr. Alexander van Biller. He is a German and Colombian lawyer, uh, lawyer sorry, and he's the founding partner of Van Biller de la Pava Bertoletti Abogados, which is um, our, our member in, for the GPSA for legal and, and, and tax services as well. They are established in Colombia since uh, 20 years from now, and such law office is focused on providing the support and legal advice to the Dal region companies that have that establishes uh, subsidiaries there, and also for M&A projects uh, uh, together with uh, doing a project finances, contracts, and all uh, areas of, of the legal advice. Together with him, we have also Luisa Buhagen. She is also a German and Colombian lawyer. She's a senior associate at the law office, and she is working there since 2016. Okay. So. Uh, she's specialized in commercial, corporate, and tax law for foreign and local Colombian companies. So, question to you, Luisa. Um, on your perspective, how far are investments protected in Colombia, especially for the foreign investors? Yeah, thanks for your introduction and question, Karen. Uh, Colombia has actually a very strict foreign investment regulation, among other reasons, due to its history and also problems with money laundering and financing of terrorism. Subject to this foreign investment regulation, especially direct foreign investments, a direct foreign investment is, for example, the capital payment in a new incorporated company, the acquisition of a participation, a capital increase, or a debt to equity swap. And it is very important to register in Colombia the foreign investment before the Colombian Central Bank, that is the Banco de la Republica, in order to be granted with the rights of a foreign investor. Once a foreign investment has been duly, duly registered with the Colombian Central Bank, 
the foreign investor will be granted the right to transfer its entire invested amount plus any capital gains abroad or to invest the achieved profit again in Colombia. Unfortunately, it still happens that foreign companies do not register its foreign investment or they commit errors when registering their investments and then they have problems in getting their money out. But the Colombian regulations, we have to say, are very stable and have been enforced since many years. So we can actually say that there's a very high legal security for foreign investments in, in Colombia. And uh, to, to end this, uh, the foreign exchange regulation in Colombia is, is a very unique, specific, detailed and strict regulation that you, that you will not find in many other countries. But when you travel to Colombia, you will find lots of other unique things as well. And, and the big majority of them, uh, you will probably find them very beautiful. So um, the country is full of surprises, but the foreign investment is, is protected in Colombia. Great, great to know. Great to, great to listen to that. So, um, Alex, I think the next one to you I would like to address is we know that digitalization is probably at its fastest pace as ever before, pushing like every corner of the innovation aspect. In this sense, what, um, what special legal innovations could be expected due to COVID uh, in Colombia? Um, yes, hello to all. Um, as last speaker, I hope still to, to have some information left because everybody has talked a lot about Colombia already. And uh, But we have learned in this time to have patience and to be wise. You can see it on, on my beard. Uh, as Riza said, in 1991, since 1991, we, we, we really opened Colombia for foreign investment. So 100% so uh, foreign investor can be owner of a company in Colombia. And uh, what you just asked, uh, how can we see really the digitalization a process going on. I, I think we have to keep in mind that Colombia has more inhabitants than Spain, so so there is a, a, a high potential uh, on on really um, on the market uh, in Colombia. And we as lawyers, uh, we, we we are keen and and also happy, of course, always to to be part of of this establishment coming into the country and not only into the country but also into the region. Um, this digital digitalization of the um, of the um, processes coming into the country, I, I think one, one big thing that we are seeing now is um, that many being at home office, as you can see in my back, it is clear that everybody has now to 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 be very fast in in this digitalization and. We, we, we see that you can really sell a lot of products from outside Colombia to Colombia and to the region. Of, of course, this brings uh, some, <clears throat> some tax uh, problems also, because you really never know uh, where, where to pay those taxes. And um, as Thorsten uh, from the AHK also already said, we have a lot of um, free trade agreements uh, in place. We, but we also have some double taxation agreements in place, with uh, which which are uh, very important to see that um, on the tax issue there is not too much uh, withholding tax um, on each side, or at least that only you pay once the withholding taxes. And on the other side, it's 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 for us lawyers very important to to to, de to define what kind of law has to be uh, applied what kind of tax law will apply to the contract. So, uh, for example, with Europe, we have double taxation agreements with Spain, with Switzerland, uh, with the Czech Republic, with Portugal, uh, with France and with uh, Great Britain. Uh, it will come in force very soon. Um, uh, we don't have one with Austria, with Germany uh, still, or with uh, Holland, but we, we, we are working on that uh, together also with the German embassy. So. I think uh, what brings the digitalization is it's a it's a fast change of of contracts, it's a fast change of tax thinking, it's a fast um, implementation issue, but it brings a lot of opportunities also for for selling from outside to the country into the region. Thank you, thank you, Alex, very much for your contribution. Uh, now. 
Before we go into the questions, thank you very much for the audience for making the questions as well. We have a second roll of, of a poll questions we have to you. I will just enable now, one second. Okay, let's launch. Great, so um, we would like to understand on your perspective, uh, what is the major uh, worry you have concerning doing business in Colombia? That is, if you already conduct local business, you may indicate your current biggest struggle, or if you are planning to do business uh, locally, what, what is your main area of concern? Like the other, just select the, the one that, the question that most apply, applies to you. Just a couple more seconds. I think we have some people still voting. Okay, I will now close the voting. Let's see the results. And Torsten, I think it has a lot to do with what you just explained at the beginning of, of our panel. I'll share the results. So most of the concern is still related to, to infrastructure. This is really interesting to see how it's applicable. So um, thank you very much. I think we will now open some, attend some of the questions. I will hide here. Okay, um, we will now start addressing some of the audience questions uh, because of the time. As you know, we are Germans. We might not be able to reply to all on, the, on this big round, but we, we have this controlled and we'll certainly come back to you individually. So perhaps, Philip, I will then pass the word back to you. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, excellent uh, moderation. We received a lot of questions, so what I will do, I will try to summarize some of them. One fits perfectly also into this last poll question, Yeah, what are the main concerns? One thing that we see here related to the topics addressed here also in the poll is of course security situation. Yeah, We see a couple of questions here from the audience Yeah, that I would like to ask to Thorsten, maybe Antonio, maybe also um, um, the colleagues that want to join. Yeah, It is basically uh, twofold the question. One is um, of course, mentioned also by Thorsten, we had in the past uh, famous stories about cartels, gangs, yeah, and the like, yeah, kidnapping. Is that still an issue compared to other Latin American markets? First question. And um, in conjunction with it, the um, audience is a bit worried about, let's say, Venezuela as a neighbor country um, with the potential, let's say, influence on the business climate. Um, some speak about uh, military conflicts, even. Um, how do you see this scenario? Maybe Torsten, you can kick it over then Antonio. Yeah. Thank you very much, Philip. Thank you very much for the question. I understand that it's a security issue is, is something to, to consider and to be considered uh, when doing business, um, not only in Colombia, but, but in the entire on the entire continent. Um, we see that in the big cities, the, the situation, the security situation has improved a lot. As I mentioned, Medellin was in the 80s. Uh, one of the most dangerous cities, which has now turned into one of the, the sort of shining stars um, on the continent. On the other hand, yes, there one has to say that there are different or some regions in Colombia where you still have um, um, gangs and also um, the FARC and ALN um, very active. So it depends really on, on where you would like to go, like close to the borders to Ecuador and to Venezuela. Yes, there are more problems than, than in the big cities. So it is always very important to see actually where you would like to go. There are certain regions where I would not uh, recommend to, to, to do, for instance, the tourism there. Um, regarding Venezuela, as I'm also responsible for Venezuela, I, I traveled there this year also. The situation there, of course, is, um, is very sad to see. Uh, I, I can't have any other words to describe that. Um, actually, I don't, see, I don't see the risk of any military a conflict between Colombia or, or Venezuela and I even think that Venezuela is a big opportunity for Colombia because when the situation there changes and the market opens 
um, the Colombian economy will hugely benefit benefit from that. Um, regarding security, no, I don't see I don't see like a military conflict uh, coming up. This is not in the interest of anyone. Um, also, when you read sometimes that the Venezuelan government is saying that the Colombian government is trying to um, is already positioning soldiers, etc., and close to the border. Uh, I don't see any reason why Colombia really should should invade um, Venezuela. And as I said, no one would no one would gain. Maybe uh, Antonio, could you add your perspective to let's say the security situation in general compared to other Latin American markets? And also, do you see a special influence on on the conflicts coming from Venezuela into into the Colombian sphere? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, first of all, uh, all the region uh, has since the 90s improved to a great extent. Uh, if we talk specifically about Colombia, Bogota, the capital, is a, a safe and secure city. Um, the statistics clearly show it. And Bogota represents 45% of the Colombian uh, GD, uh, uh, domestic product. So this is a key picture. And if we look to the other main cities in the um, in the country, like Cali, like uh, uh, Barranquilla, uh, Cartagena, Medellin, they are safe cities. The situation during the past years have improved a lot. Um, concerning uh, Venezuela, the situation is a little bit different. Uh, I know Venezuela since more than uh, 10 years, as I have been based there for many, many years. Um, the situation, uh, well, is not uh, from uh, microcriminality, if we talk about this, uh, the safest one, but it has never been the safest one even 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, the situation, of course, in the past years uh, has become uh, more uh, dangerous. But coming back to the question, I do not see uh, any military intervention about anything. Uh, we see the media, of course, like to uh, report about possible threats. Uh, but a military intervention, I think it's not in the interest of Venezuela, it's not in the interest of Colombia, and it's not in the interest uh, of uh, the whole Andean region. Overall, I think Colombia has a stable economy that has developed positively, a shining star in the past decades, and Venezuela, even if now the figures uh, are not the best, as I mentioned before, has the biggest um, reserves of oil uh, worldwide. So it is also here. I'm sorry, Antonio, we lost you quick, quickly. Um... I think so. I think it's perfect. Um, I think we lost the uh, connection to to Bogota uh, to Antonio. Uh, uh, sorry for that. But anyways, um, we have a couple more questions. Let me take the opportunity to go to the next. Yeah, and also related to the poll question, infrastructure was mentioned here. Martin Duisberg from the Z Bank, for instance, asked here Thorsten. Regarding the infrastructure project, is there a local financing long term at reasonable cost available? Do you see chances for German companies basically here to participate in infrastructure projects? The big topic also in Brazil that we also see, yeah. Um, as Germans are um, no more real big infrastructure companies in Germany, only some engineering and technology companies. So, how do you see that situation for us in, in, in Colombia? Um, well, first of all, regarding the financing, um, most of it is is being done by PPP. So there's a lot of private investment coming in. Regarding actually the conditions uh, for for loans and for long-term loans, I I would need to get back to Mr. Duisburg, which I will definitely do. Um, regarding the opportunities of German companies to participate in these uh, in these projects, yes, we see good, uh, we see um, great. Uh, 
potential for German companies, yes, especially those service and technology providers, um, because even though Chinese companies are or won most of the most of the big projects like the the metro project in Bogota, they're still looking for for also technology and solutions from from companies from other countries, and we are also in touch with those. Uh, general contractors, so we are more than happy to to connect the German uh, companies with those um, with those companies who are actually uh, building the the infrastructure here. Excellent. Um, another question from Martin Duisberg was here um, that which segment uh, do you see specifically investment opportunities here for German corporations and investors? A very very important question also um, for German investors. Um, I definitely we definitely see opportunities in agriculture. So if you talk about fruits, also organic agriculture, um, because for instance you can have more harvests here in Colombia than in other countries due to the due to the climate and other factors. And uh, also there's a big opportunity in flowers. May, many people don't know that actually Colombia is the second largest exporters of flowers. Uh, just right after Holland, um, so there's also um, there's also there are also opportunities in tourism. We saw a lot of opportunities uh, last year. More than sixty thousand Germans came to Colombia. That was an, uh, a new record high. Um, of course, now the tourism is, is has been heavily affected. So let's see how is this, how it is recuperating. But in general, we see in tourism also um, big potential. We saw investment coming into commercial space and to apartments. Um, we also need to see how that sector will will develop after after COVID. And I would also mention logistics. As I said, that the local, the Colombian government is also looking to use the the rivers for the logistics. Um, I think there are also big potential for German companies or European companies to to invest in. And of course, Peron also to mention the renewable energy sector, which is which is increasing also as I also mentioned. Perfect, perfect, Austin. Awesome. Thanks. Antonio, uh, are you in a position to answer questions? Is your microphone going uh, well? Let's test quickly. Unfortunately, we don't hear you. It's, um, I'm really sorry. So, um, but we can do the questions to you. Yeah, I will collect them, and Karen will send to you, and we will find a way to get your uh, your answers to to our uh, participants. Yeah, sorry for the technical little issue there. But we have more questions, so I would um, um, skip that Antonio, Antonio for for the moment. Yeah, and would we'll go to. Maybe an interesting question for Andreas Wirt here from, from Verzos. He says here, um, how complex, that's a very interesting question he also made to our GPSA partner, how complex is a tax system in Colombia, VAT, income tax, proper tax, all that topics, yeah, comparable to other markets here in South America, especially Brazil that he operated in, yeah, which is very complex. Yeah. Um, would you say it, it's um, also Mexico, Germany as, as a benchmark, is it moderate? Or like US, easy. Alex, maybe, or, or Luisa. Uh, Alex, you are muted. Um, yeah, um, I, I I can answer that question. I I think that uh, we we received some technical advice from the German GEZ <laughs> at our tax authorities, and they really helped. Uh, digitally, they really helped to uh, increase all the the follow up and all the processes. So um, at the end, what is happening is that uh, all our tax um, filings, all our um, tax uh, com are complicated to, to, to say that way. Yeah? We, we have to file a lot. We have to work a lot now. The companies have to work a lot now for the tax authority. Formerly, the tax authority worked more for us. Now, the companies have to work a lot for, for, for the tax authority. But, of course, that makes it easier for the tax authority to make the controls. And um, I think uh, we, we are part, part now, as Alejandro Garcia said, of the OCDE. And our standards are now much more uh, complicated, but uh, effective for the Colombian government to, to receive the income tax payments to receive the withholding taxes <clears throat> also to receive the VAT so so I think I think um, it's complex of course but it's not so bureaucratic like in other countries we can do a lot virtually and maybe that's the positive issue as a lot can be done virtually 
Um, our invoices are now uh, electronic uh, invoices, so it's 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 a really how to say safe, controlled um, um, environment, um, and and not not easy to understand, but uh, it's it's uh, it's more or less fair, uh, and it leads to less corruption, which is also a very important issue in our countries. Excellent. Um, as we are here um, uh, officially at 12.30, uh, but still have more than 140 people um, listening in, I would suggest we make an overtime of 15 minutes, um, or because we have so many questions still here on the, on, on the plate that I would like uh, to, to address. Yeah, let's say another 15 minutes uh, overtime, um, as uh, again, 140 people are still here live with us. Yeah. Um, also, Andreas Wirt yeah, um, asked uh, about incentive programs. Are there any specific incentives by the government or state counties for foreign investors in place? Um, um, and for example, tax credits, direct subsidies for certain investments or and or new jobs. Who wants to take that question? It's a free one. Um, so, so Philip, I could. Um answer the question and then we can share ideas about that so so we have been thinking about how our taxes have been changing over the last three years and uh as Thorsten mentioned there are many incentives to the agriculture sector orange economy sector technology sector and clean um clean energy sector so these um sectors have benefits on the income tax so the income tax have been reduced to this sector also um over this COVID crisis we have been seeing it very positive that the tax authorities has modernized and they have all the um, tax filings um online as alexander also mentioned and as a benefit for the companies too, because they are forced to file their taxes that, so that they can do it easily now. And something that is coming up is that we have a tax reform. So in this tax reform uh, that was published a couple of days ago, they are um, categorizing the companies. So then you have a micro, a small, medium, and big companies. So if you come as a, micro company or as a medium-sized company the tax income that you're gonna pay will be less so now we are talking about that the colombian companies are paying uh between 32 and 35 percent and this uh, percentage is going to be reduced to 20 percent so this is going to be very positive to the companies from uh, european countries and countries like germany that are thinking of starting their business in colombia Excellent, yes. Becky. Yeah. So then here may be a question for Thorsten, yeah, from Diana Sanabria. Um, well, it's not a secret that human rights violations yeah, um, are apparently very common in Colombia, especially in the agricultural sector because of territorial disputes. Now, um, how are you working with your team to ensure that enterprise regard the UN guiding principle on business and human rights in Colombia and apply human rights due diligence? Are you accompanying enterprises building a sustainable business? Great question for those. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Diana. This is definitely a sector in which we are looking to work even more. Um, we are already in touch with Global Compact. We are doing certain initi initiatives with the GIZ. And uh, Diana, well, if you're interested, actually, we are looking at this point of time. We already published our um, um, this the, 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 um, the search for a new colleague. Exact, um, exactly in this field, the sustainable development of, of economy. Uh, this is actually what we want to focus on more, I guess, maybe latest at the end of the year, we will start with new projects on that. Diana, um, I'm more than happy to, to get in touch with you. If you have any ideas, um, we'll be glad to hear that. Great. One question to our auditors here, Andreas Wirt again, uh, what gap, um, Janet accepted all of it. Uh, auditing principles is officially uh, uh, in Colombia. That's an easy one for Becky. <laughs> so, 
So our account, we I want to talk first about our accounting principles. We are using IFRS International Accounting Standards, and we are using the international auditing standards as well. Um, so that's a short answer. Perfect. Um, so that's also a tricky question, but an interesting one. I want to take also some other ones. Yeah, I'm listening to a lot of positive perspective. Yeah, now you'll see what will come. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, uh, our partner in Colombia is struggling with a lockdown. Yeah. Um, now, uh, has, there's some uh, emergency that has delayed the custom office or cannot be sent to clients outside of Bogota. It was many not even allowed to go to the office. Customers are not able to pay on time. But July, August seems to be a financial support to, uh, to keep employees. Well, um, that's not working so far. I understand the lockdown is drastically. Is there any special permission required can be applied? Thank you. Who wants to take that question? That's a more tricky one. Um, I, I, can, I can try to give my perspective from that question. Obviously, not knowing all the details from uh, from from uh, your current partner in Colombia. Uh, definitely, the lockdown um, was at the beginning very strict in Bogota, and uh, well, people were not allowed to to go to the offices, and um, people should have stayed home during all the time. Still, um, the government uh, had around between 30 and 40 exceptions. For the people, so allowing some businesses to continue uh, production, for example, in the area of food production or or health or or other issues. No, um, I believe that at the beginning, probably the lockdown affected more the companies. Um, as of today, definitely the situation is not uh, as already mentioned. The peak has not been the peak of cases uh, has not been achieved. So arrived. Uh, we will we are also still in a strict lockdown in 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 Bogota, and we will have that for the coming weeks. Um, but I I believe that that things are 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 better. Uh, as as she mentioned, the government has uh, has has provided some support in the areas of payroll to to companies to support their payroll. So the companies have to apply uh, and and, for, and and fill some some information. And apply that to this information. Uh, my understanding is that um, yes, probably it is working. It is not working perfectly, but we have heard that it is working, and some of our clients have received uh, those uh, those support from the governments. Um, um, yeah, to 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 see if if customs is working. Well, many of our clients do have have had some logistics issues. Due to, to lockdown, the, the logistics, let's say, chain has been much slower, starting from cost from the from the from the uh, um, government side of customs, and then to deliver to the end customers. Um, I don't know if if the specifics, but I know that, uh, or my understanding from my clients is that things are more or less working, and probably in uh, will be better in the coming weeks obviously as i mentioned not knowing all the issues that your partner is having um yeah it's difficult to, to know that Philip, if you let me just just maybe adding adding a few points i guess we heard that um there are delays in the in the in the port of cartagena with previous previously it took like three to four days to get out uh, the product now it could take uh, up to seven or eight days and then there's another problem in the logistics saying that there are not enough trucks in Cartagena to move the goods to, to Bogota because they would go, they would need to go from Bogota to Cartagena without any goods and then come back with the goods. Um, I know that this has been a problem um, in the past month as well. And um, as Alejandro already said, the government here in, in Bogota is also putting a lot lockdown on certain neighborhoods. So they're always moving from one neighborhood to another. At this point of time, there are eight neighborhoods uh, under complete lockdown. So that also means that the people who live there, they cannot go to the office. If your office is there and you're not among those 30 or 40 exemption, which Alejandro Romain also mentioned, you, you cannot open. 
Yes. Uh, she, she mentioned, just sorry, Philip. She mentioned that it's uh, the, the partner is in the food and pharma industry. Uh, there have been some, for example, for for the imports of pharma productions or pharma products that are required for the current health crisis. Uh, the government has has even provided some tax incentives to reduce the VAT and and some other issues. So um, definitely, I think that that she would should take should talk with her partner here in Colombia to see how they can also use those uh, process of those incentives. Excellent. Um, we I think we are really uh, here on good track. We still have more almost 130. Participant live with us, so I think I go another five minutes here. So, for, as we said, over time 45, I think it's really worth it as we have so many questions. One question specific is interesting here also for our GPSA members. This question is for um, uh, Luisa, Alex, uh, Alejandro. What are the key advantages for foreign uh, investors to work with a B2B or BPO or legal outsourcing service provider like yours versus going direct? Well, Luisa, do you want to start? Ladies first, maybe. Ladies first. Okay, uh, Philip, I was just, uh, I didn't get the entire question. So uh, what, I, what I got is basically that uh, the advantage to, to work with the BPO outsourcing. What are the advantages of outsourcing to legal, legal counsel like you Mm-hmm. Well, first of all, um, I think uh, outsourcing uh, could be uh, cost effective. So um, you don't have uh, the entire costs of, um, of, of a higher lawyer with, with the high uh, social security uh, costs that, that you have here in Colombia. And especially, I think the most important thing is, uh, is expertise. So um, you really have, if you have punctual questions, you are really able to receive a high specific and uh, high value um value answers and for example in our law firm we are all we speak english german and and spanish and we also know the german legal system and the colombian legal system so um we are also able to to compare um legal systems and and to give our clients a, a better understanding of of the legal situation here in the in the country Perfect. Uh, Alejandro, you want something to add for the accounting outsourcing? Yes, just 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 to mention that also, um, as as Lisa mentioned, uh, we as we as a local partner and and all of all of us the local partners uh, have gained experience working working with foreign companies in Colombia. You know? so we 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 share that that core understanding of the the needs of our of our foreign clients uh, when they come to Colombia, and we have an understanding of also what's happening in the in the in the in the local countries no uh what's happening in germany in terms of 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 taxes or 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 accounting standards or auditing standards or legal standards because we are able also so be, we 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 do our business also with their companies abroad so we we have those those information flow from our clients coming all the time for us so we have to also reply that and we have gained that experience and I believe that that's very good um, also to, to be able to, to have a high standard of, of our services to our clients. Excellent. I hope that answers the question of Nico Jones uh, that I just, uh, has been addressed. I think we can take a last one here. Yeah, and everything that we could not answer yet, yeah, we will uh, touch base individually, of course. Yeah. So basically, there is uh, one more question here about the sector question here, uh, maybe to Thorsten. What about the biotechnology and life science sector? What what opportunities or risks do you see there, Thorsten? Well, this is also this is also one of the sectors in which the government wants to do more and wants to give incentives for for foreign companies to to invest in. I could actually right now not say a lot about the status quo of the sector. I'm I'm more than happy to work on that with my team. Um, so if that person could also get back to me directly, I would then definitely send more information. Excellent. I think we can call it a great uh, web conference. Yeah. Um, thanks again for all the panelists for your invaluable um, insight and experiences, all the great questions from the participants. Um, I 
I, I took away that uh, basically Colombia truly has the potential to be, uh, as uh, Thorsten called it, a rising star, not only a shining star in South America. Um, well, um, this was a kickoff for the South American event series. There will be more events coming. The next one in August will focus on the other Pacific Alliance uh, stars, uh, uh, Chile and Peru. Um, please contact uh, to us to subscribe to our newsletter. If you don't have, you'll receive our Save the Date and Invite uh, in, uh, shortly. And uh, last but not least, you will receive um, uh, following up automatically from the, from the uh, webinar tool here, you will receive a survey that we would really uh, happy to receive feedback on from you to continuously improve our, our webinars. Yeah? So again, thank you all for your participation and have a blessed afternoon or evening, wherever you may be. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you all. <laughs>